much for the nice introduction. I'm sorry guys, this is not gonna be about Elixir. It's gonna be about category theory, yes! <laughs> so, you probably have heard a couple of times this word today and yesterday as well, um, but this is gonna be completely different from the talks that you have seen so far. So, um, we are gonna see some code uh, don't worry about it, it's on GitHub. You can have a look at it later. What I would like you to do is to follow the journey that we, I'm, I'm gonna guide you through, okay? So first of all, hi guys, I'm Daniela, and why am I here? Because being a Scala programmer sometimes is painful. So when I started my career, I did Java, and uh, at uni, I didn't study any functional programming whatsoever. Right? It was objects, objects, objects. Gang of four, know all the, par all the patterns by heart, and that's it. There's nothing else. Right? And um, yeah, then after a while, I decided to try something different. And I started to um, approach the Scala world. And suddenly, I realized that I didn't know what I was doing. Right? I'm not a mathematician. Right, and it was extremely painful. Sometimes it's still today pretty painful. And when I say that I'm not a mathematician, I say that in a good way. I wish I was a mathematician because my life would have been so much simpler now, right? I have to admit there was a Lambda Calculus course when I was at uni, but it was extremely difficult. The teacher was uh, really tough at grading. So eh, didn't take it. So all now everything is coming back and it's extremely painful. So um, this talk is the result of myself going away and reteaching myself the basics because I wanted to understand what the beep all these people were talking when I was going at conferences. Why, why do they care so much about all these principles? Why? They are so passionate about it. So, um, this is not going to be a mathematical introduction because we had a few already, and plus I'm not a mathematician. This is going to be my practical view on all the basics, some of the basics of category theory, right? So there are not going to be many formulas. So don't worry about it. Hopefully it's going to be fun, and hopefully we will understand was the general intuition between all these nice theories. So a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, you don't need category theory to write good Scala functional code. Uh, functional programming itself is fairly simple, right? Avoid mutability, write functions that are pure. You don't need to know category theory to write Scala code. You don't even know category theory to write functional code. Again, the principles are really simple. So why am I here on stage trying to sell you out this theory? Because it's beautiful. After you go through the pain, everything is gonna be magical. And you will have a better understanding of why we write things the way we write it. Okay? So I'm gonna start trying to motivate why we care about category theory. And the first uh, example that I would like to provide you is simply how we reason, right? So every time we write some program, independently from any paradigm that we might use, either object-oriented or functional programming, what we want to do is basically you want to teach the computer something. So we want to teach the computer to reason. So the first question is, how do we reason, right? So let's assume that um, we just had lunch, Sorry, spoiler alert. We just had lunch and we had to come upstairs to watch, um, to watch talk. So we know that we need to take the stairs, then turn right, turn left, and turn right again, right? We know the steps, right? But when we do this, our brain doesn't think about, okay, I'm gonna contract the muscles in my leg to you know, do one step and then the other, right? What we actually do is that we do two things. We abstracted out 
all the details that don't matter because we know how to work, right? And we divide our task in steps, okay? So category theory is simply telling us, is studying how things compose. And in order to do that, it has to forget a lot of details that are not important, right? So there's no wonder why it's so powerful, because it's extremely useful when trying to represent things. But category theory, it's a difficult name, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm going to call it Haro theory. That's it. And um, we're going to see in a second why I'm going to call it Haro theory. And the reason why I'm going to call it Haro theory is because the only things that matter are basically arrows. So what is a category? It's an object. I'm going to comment on that, what an object is. And something, let's call it Haro, that has connects two objects together with a start and an end. What is an object? No idea. The only thing that we know is the arrow. The arrow is something that connects two objects. We are lucky. We are not mathematicians. Uh, so we can just assume that for the programs that we write, objects sometimes are types and arrows are functions, right? But in theory, mathematicians have a much harder job because it could be anything, right? Cool, everyone clear so far? You probably recognize this concept from another like four or five talks on this. Good. Okay, so th there are some laws that are the rules of our game. Um, the first rule is the composition law. It basically means that if we know how to go from A to B and to B to C, then we automatically know how to go from A to C by composing the two arrows together, yeah? I'm going to go quickly on this because I know we've seen it. Um, the other law is that you need to have an identity. So you need to have the opportunity to stay where you are. And that is basically the little arrow here. Um, it just means that it does nothing, right? So if you go through the identity and then you move, you use the function, is the same of just using the function, yeah? I promise this will be... We are almost done with the mathematical parts and then we can go to the fun stuff. Um, last, of, last rule that we have, so so far we're seeing composition identity is associativity. Nothing crazy, just it means that we don't care about the parentheses. Uh, what this means is that the green path is the same of the black one. Why would we don't care about parentheses? Because we have better things to do with life, right? So, these are our game, right? So, category, it's, um, it's a set of arrows that connects objects together, and they have these rules. Identity, composition, associativity. If you don't have these rules, it's not a category. Okay? Cool. Um, so, as Runa said, congratulations, you have learned everything there is to know about category theory. Um, so, but what do we care, right? Because we are programmers, we're not mathematicians. So we do this all the time, we just don't realize it. So this is an example of a category. So imagine you have the set of all the strings in the world, and then you have all the ints and all the balls. We know that if there is a function between string and int, let's say, call it size, and we have a function that goes from int to ball, call it bigger than two, we know that automatically we can create a new function that is called size bigger than two, right? We do this all the time. Same for it, the identity is possible to define the identity on a specific type. Okay? So everybody with me so far, yeah? The mathematical bit is almost over. Cool? Okay, let's start simple. What is a category with one object? Same rule as before, you have two objects, no, yeah, well, in this case it's just one, so it's even simpler, and you need to have composition and associativity, right? So, this is basically the representation, it's exactly the same graph that we have seen before, just with 
one object. But you know, mathematicians make to think to do like to make everything harder, so they give weird names. And in this case, the weird name is monoid. They could have called the category one object, but it would, was probably too long. Um, and the rules are exactly the same, right? Identity, composition, associativity. Don't worry about the formulas. For us, the formulas are just tests that we can write once and run every once in a while, right? So we don't need to necessarily fully understand all the formulas. In fact, in my code, that is exactly what it did. I did it. Um, so, uh, oh, it's a little bit cut. Yeah, what a shame. It's going to be fine. Um, I don't expect you guys to read this. It's just to say that don't worry if you know, don't understand the rules. What you have to do is to copy them from a nice article, implement them with Scala check or whatever language you use, and you're going to be fine. You don't have to worry about them, right? Um, but let's see a practical example of why we care about a monoid. Um, super classical example, uh, same one that uh, Runa showed us. Let's assume that we want to represent all the natural numbers, right? Um, so this could be done with a monoid. So again, definition of monoid, it needs to have an identity and it needs to have an operation. So let's assume that um, I have an object that represents all the int, and I need to pick an operation and then the identity that obviously is compatible, compatible with that operation. Um, the operation, for example, could be the addition, and in this case, the identity is zero, right? So what is a monoid? It's basically the arrow zero uh, that gets combined with the arrow one with the operation plus, okay? So um, the reason why I'm saying that this is a representation of all the natural numbers is because you can create new arrows by combining two existing ones. So let's assume that I want to create the arrow number four. All I have to do is to combine the arrow one with the arrow three. And I will get a new row that is four. Okay? Cool. Uh, and obviously, again, identity is important. If you pick any arrow and you combine it with zero, you still get the same, the same uh, number back. Yeah, all well, good. But hey, we like code. How can we represent this in code, right? So um, this, ooh, what a shame. Um, any, anyone from the staff that could kind of fix the, the screen would be great. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Awesome, you saved the presentation. Cool, super cool. OK, back on track, no panic. Everything is fine. You can do it. OK, Bacon is with me. Um, so um, Scala, right? We have type classes. All this means is that we need to define a type class that is called monoid that has two functions, an identity and uh, the composition that in this case would be just be a function that we call compose, right? We, we know how to do this. We do it every day, right? So for example, uh, if we want to implement the instance of um, a monoid for int, this is exactly the translation of the little graph that I showed you before, right? So for an int, compose will simply be the sum between two int, and the identity will be zero, right? But obviously, this doesn't apply only to ints. It also applies to strings, right? So you can define exactly the same thing, but for strings, where monoid is the concatenation of two strings, and the identity is the empty string. Yeah, everybody with me so far? Cool, now let's do some little bit more interesting stuff. Right? So, let's assume I have this beautiful category uh, that has a flower, has a little triangle, right? This is my beautiful category. 
And it is a category, right? The reason why it's a category is because I have an identity for every object and I have an arrow that connects my, my object. I should also um, prove that, you know, composition works, composition is associative, but hey, we can leave that to the mathematicians. So um, what happens if we put our category in a box? So what I mean with that is that we take every object and we put it in a box. And then we take every arrow and we copy it over. Okay? So this is a little game that we are gonna do with our category. So again, the rules are you take the object and you put it in a box and then you copy the arrows. Um, basically what happens is that you create a new category. Um, that in a way is a similar view of the previous one. But what you are doing is that here you're adding some information. And this information is metadata, is this box. Um, so to help you visualize this, you're basically saying, this is my data, but by the way, you need to know this thing about this data that I'm giving you, okay? And we do this in Scala every time. An example, option, tells us that the data might or might not be there. Or list, might tell us that there is zero or more instances of that data. Try, that box could explode any second. Future, that box will take a while to be filled in and it might not be a nice value to find, right? So we know how to do this. We do it already. We just don't realize there is category theory. Um, so again, um, weird names for simple things, category in a box, this idea of adding metadata about your data is called functor. And the rules are similar to what we have seen so far. Again, identity, composition, associativity. The formulas are getting a little bit more complex, but it's fine, we can handle it. So, there you go, Scala check for the win. We can just copy and paste them and create some tests that will make sure that whatever implementation we provide, they're still gonna respect the laws of our game. Yeah? Um, another way of seeing this is basically, um, what this graph is telling us is that we have a flower and we have a triangle and we know how to get there. But if we have a flower in a box, automatically we know that we can transform the flower in a box into a triangle in a box. We know this because these are the rules of our game. Right? And how do we code this? Again, type class. Right? So we say, if you want to call yourself functor, you need to tell me how to implement this function. This function is called map, and it tells me that if you give me a box of A, and you give me a way to transform the A into a B, then you need to tell me how to return a box of B. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Yeah? It's just following the types. We do this all the time. So, just to demonstrate you guys that you don't need a powerful language to do this, I decided not to use option, the standard type in Scala to define something that could, could or could not be there, but I defined it my own. So I've defined uh, new um, type that is called maybe, inspired a little bit by Haskell, but it's fine. We are not gonna tell them. Um, that has two possible value, just that contains a value, and empty that contains nothing. Okay? Nothing fancy in this, right? We're not using anything particular from the language. 
And yet, um, we can implement a functor for our type maybe. And the logic that we are going to use is, if my box contains a value, cool, then I'm just going to apply that function to the value, and I'm going to keep the box. If my box is empty, sorry, bro, there's nothing I can do. OK? Same thing with list. If my box contains nothing, there's nothing I can do. But if my box contains one or more elements, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to apply the function on each of those elements. Yeah? Everybody with me so far? Cool? OK, next. So we, we have a better idea of what these kind of boxes are. But we can really put whatever we want in these boxes, um, even a function, right? So let's assume that we have um, this kind of situation. So we have a box that contains a function, and then we have a box that contains a value. And everything that we can do so far is open a box, look inside, change a little bit the value, and that's it. There is nothing else that we can do. So you kind of could have an intuition that this could be solvable, right? But there is a little detail that, um, there is a little operation that we don't know how to do, right? Because we need to basically open two boxes, combine the values together, and then put them in a new box, OK? Um, and this process of opening multiple boxes and smashing them together, uh, the mathematicians call them applicative. It's a scary word. It took me around two years to get used to it. But you will get there. Uh, I did it, so everyone can do it. Um, there are a lot of rules about it. Um, but the key point here is, again, we have our three best friends, identity, composition, associativity. And again, all you have to do is to find the formulas uh, that express these mathematical laws and just translate them into tests. OK? So the things that we need to do in order to implement this in our code is that we need to know how to create a new box. And we need to open multiple boxes so that we can put the values together. OK? What are we going to use to implement it? A type class. So we know how to open a box, right? We, we have seen that. That's a functor. Um, but now we have two operations that we are not sure how to do, right? Uh, one is creating the new box. Uh, that we are going to call pure. And the other one is combining values together. And we are going to call it up for some, from applicative. OK? And this is a type class, right? So all we, all we have to do is defining the contract. And then once we are going to go and actually implement the case class, sorry, not the case class, uh, the, the, the implementation for the type class, we will define what that means, right? But at this stage, we just say we are just defining the contract. Spoiler alert, if we have pure and we have a AP, we don't actually have to define map. Um, this is the type of programming that I call type programming. It's basically when all you have to do is scream at the compiler, let the compiler scream at you. And then after a while, you combine how to, you figure out how to combine all the pieces together. But it's, it's just to analyze the types that um, you have. And after a while, you will see how you can derive functions from existing others. OK? But obviously, um, function usually don't take just one parameter. What happens if my function that it's in the box takes more than one parameter? 
Well, it's the same, right? We just have more boxes to open and more values to combine. So for that reason, uh, in, at least in the scale implementations that I've seen so far, what you have is that you have a lot of function AP, and they do AP1, AP2, AP3, AP4, up to 22. That's because we need to know how many parameters we need in order to apply our function. Okay? Cool. Um, example of implementation, right? So for an applicative for maybe. So what is the logic, right? I have a lot of boxes and all these boxes are maybe. So if I can open them all, then awesome, I'll take the values and then apply the function, so smash them together and then put them in a new box. What happens if any of them is empty? Sorry, bro, can't do anything. Um, so that is a really um, easy implementation. Um, things get a little bit more complicated with other types. Um, for example, for list, you basically need to define what type of structure, strategy you want to use. But you know, it's still, it's still doable. The, you, you probably so far should have recognized the pattern. You have a type class and then you do some pattern matching. That is all you need to, to have in your language to be able to implement a basic category theory library. Okay? Cool, are we ready for the magic step? Yes, we are. Cool, so what happens if something like this uh, happens, right? So I have a box and then I open it and because I apply the function that returns a box itself, now I have a box in a box. So far, we don't know how to get rid of one box, right? The operation that we have seen so far is how to create a new box from scratch, how to combine values, and how to open a box, right? But this could happen. Um, so basically, now we have this new problem. And our problem is, suppose that some, for some reason I have a box in a box. That's not really interesting, right? I have metadata about my metadata. So most of the time, what you actually want to do is to want to just get rid of that extra box, right? And revolutionary moment, believe it or not, for me it was one of the mind-blowing moments of my category theory journey. Fusing two boxes together is basically a monad. I do apologize. <laughs> but it's basically, it's all there is, right? All this fuss about monads is just smashing boxes together. That's it, right? Nothing else. The real revolution, I do think that it's the functor because it allows you to add information on top of your data. But monad is just smashing boxes, really. Um, Again, you have um, rules. I didn't put the formulas because I couldn't understand them. Uh, so I didn't feel <laughs> confident in putting in there because they're a little bit crazy. Um, but once I understand them, I will probably put there. But hey, I managed to copy and paste them and create a nice uh, scala check test for it, right? So in my um, simple implementation of super basic category theory library, I was able to write tests that make sure that the monad laws are followed. Okay? So, um, again, what we have seen, believe it or not, is that the monad is opening a box and smashing them together. So, in more practical term, that means that a monad is a functor, meaning has a map, and then it has a flatten. What is flattened is just meshing box together. So giving two boxes, I want a box back. Okay? 
And because it turns out that this operation of smashing boxes together is fairly common, um, what we have in Scala is that we have an alias that is called flat map, that is basically map it and then flatten, right? It's just convenience, okay? But the reason why uh, people are so passionate about monads is because it allows you to do things in sequence, right? So let's assume that you have a box A and then you have a function uh, that you apply to the box and you have, because you are using flat map, you basically move from a box of A to a box of B. What you can do is basically you can concatenate all these operations and basically build a path that goes from box of A to box of D. If you are familiar to, Sc to Scala, this is basically this code. We know how to use for comprehension, right? It's like a lesson two of when we start learning Scala, but they don't tell us that it's a monad that we are working on. They just tell us, yeah, yeah, syntactic sugar, don't worry, it works. Of course it works, it's beautiful, okay? Everybody with me so far. Cool. Okay, next step, that is something that, uh, it took me a while to understand, but uh, if of any consolation, it took a while to the ask of people as well, is that actually, monad is a little bit more powerful than a, than a functor. And if you are willing to swap things around a little bit, it turns out that monad is also an applicative. So in the previous implementation that we have seen, we basically, we were leaving abstract flap map and map. <coughs> but if we are willing to extend applicative instead of functor, meaning to have a pure uh, function instead of a map, and we leave flap map as not implemented, all the functions come as a consequence, right? This basically means that you can see a monad either has a map plus flap map, uh, sorry, map plus flatten, or you can see a monad has pure plus flat map, okay? And there you go, that's a, a, that's a possible implementation, right? Where uh, pure, we already seen what pure is. Pure is the same thing that um, we have seen when we discussed applicative, is just basically just a way. So we put our value in a new fresh box, and flat pump is just matching over um, box of A. If we have a value, you apply the function. If you don't have a box, nothing to do, okay? So this kind of code should look to you fairly reasonable. If not, I do apologize. I can improve my own code. Talk to me later. Okay, cool. And now, um, the sentence uh, that everybody's using to explain what a monad is. A monad is a monoid in the category of n functors. Right? <laughs> okay, but now we kind of have the tools to understand what it is. Okay. So I have highlighted two words in this sentence. The first word is monoid, and the second one is endofunctor. Endofunctor is basically the same of functors. The reason why we say endofunctors is because we are programmers. Our life is 20 times easier than mathematicians. So we never go, we never create new categories from scratch. So when we create a function, a functor in Scala or any other language, we are basically mapping one category into the same category we are in. We are always talking about types and functions, right? It's called endofunctor when the source category and the tar ca target categories are the same, okay? But if you are confused with that, don't worry, you can just say functors 
and probably mathematicians are going to be upset, but it's fine. Okay? The second word is monoid. And we have seen that monoid means basically two things. You have an identity and you have composition. Okay? Composition is when you put things together, two arrows together, and uh, identity is basically an arrow that does nothing. Okay? Talking about code, monoid basically means that you have a pure function and you have a flatten function. Flatten is just squeezing things together. And the functors, it just means that you have a map. If you guys recall, in our trade, we had pure and flat map. Pure, flat map. There you go. You guys can now understand that crazy sentence. Happy days. Cool. So um, let's summarize a little bit what we have seen. Hopefully, things should be a little bit clearer now. Um, so we have seen category theory is helping us study how things compose. We don't care about the little details. Monoid is a category um, with only one object and is used usually to combine things together. Functor is just giving us some metadata about our data. Um, obligative is applying different values from the same context in an independent way. And monad is just concatenating operations in sequence in the same context. Okay? Cool. So this was the result of me studying for six months a lot of uh, different sources. Okay? Thank you, Mr. Bastos, uh, for his really useful videos. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. So this, you will intentionally not going to be able to read this. This is from Rob Norris, and this is just a mapping of all the type classes that have been defining cats. That is one of the libraries to express this type of concept in Scala. There's a lot of things that we haven't dis discussed. And there are a lot of things that I still have to study. Um, but the whole idea of category theory, and, and if you want the idea of this talk, is that don't worry about the details. Focus only about how things compose. And finally, if you want to follow um, what I did and maybe study a little bit more about category theory, these are my favorite resources. Um, the first one, it's a um, presentation by Philip Walden here at Lambda World last year. Uh, it was really good. It goes through the basics, through what product uh, and sum is, um, product co product. Um, Bartosz did an amazing series of videos uh, about category theory. They're extremely useful. Um, um, he recently, he also wrote, a, over the years, he wrote a blog post that the community decided to translate into a book. So they have created a nice, thick PDF of all these articles. It's free, so you can just go online. I'll, I'll post the link on Twitter and download the PDF. And um, this is the link for the mapping of all the type classes in CAT. And if you want, the place where I started, it was just the CAT documentation. And the reason why I think it's a good place to start is because they basically tell you what is the use of all the things that they describe. So this was me. If you want to actually see the implementation, of the code. This is, was originally a workshop, so you guys got your life easier because I gave you all the answers straight away. Um, if you guys want to actually see the implementation, that's my GitHub link. And if you guys want to come and find me or send me a tweet, uh, I'm always here for you to, to have a chat. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>